Please join me in the prayer of illumination. O loving and all-embracing God, our Father, we praise and worship you for your love that will not let us go. We worship you for becoming one of us in Jesus Christ and for giving yourself to us and for us. We celebrate and rejoice in your presence in the Holy Spirit and Christ our Lord. Basics. We talk about it in school, giving them our basic reading, writing, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we do that also in, in families, in, in our society. We say we need to get back to the basics, back to the way it was, the way it should be. That's what's important is we get back to basics. So I tell you what, this morning, I'm gonna, this is basic to our faith. I'm going to get right back. It, it starts, it's this way. Inheritance, incarnation, and inclusion. Don't let any of those words bug you. We'll talk about it. But this is the very basis, basis of what we are, what we believe as Christian people, okay? Inheritance, incarnation, inclusion. Colossians, first chapter, 11 through 20. May you, may you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power. May you be prepared to endure everything with patience, while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who, was, who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued you from the power of darkness and transferred you for unto us unto the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things invisible, things invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, so that we might, he might become to have the first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of the cross. This is the basis. Not going to get any more basic than what we're talking about this morning. If each of us were to make a list of all the things for which we're thankful, Donna did that this morning, she had her top ten list, each of us would have our own list, would be, and it would be unique, very personal, and if we're honest, very long. However, Thanksgiving can be a very dangerous holiday, did you know that? I'm not referring to the calories we'll consume, or the risk we'll take being on the highway traveling to Grandma's house. I'm saying that Thanksgiving can be dangerous in the spiritual sense if we're not conscious of the needs of others. It's very easy for us, especially in this great nation with all that we have, to become almost arrogant to the point of what we have. It's a very dangerous road to go down, I tell you. Well, think about it. For instance, when we give thanks for our good health, what does that say to people who are not healthy? Does that mean that we are more deserving than they are, and that, or somehow God loves us more than, than they, we do that He does them? When we thank God for our nice homes or our families or our freedom as Americans, what does that say about good, decent, God-loving people around the world who don't have those blessings? And there are a lot of them. I have no ready answers for such questions, and neither does anyone else for that matter. I just hope, hope that as we give thanks this Thursday and all the rest of the year that we do it for the right reasons. Now, what are some of the right reasons that every Christian, regardless of their circumstances, in every corner of the world can be thankful for this Thanksgiving season? What are those I'm talking about, okay? In our lesson from Paul's letter to the Colossians, we have some solid suggestions. The first thing for which we should be thankful, according to St. Paul, is our inheritance. 
rejoice, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints. We have inherited something. An inheritance, you see, however, is not an award for outstanding merit. An inheritance does not pay for a job well done. It is not something we want to, we earn or deserve or create by our own efforts. An inheritance is a gift, a gift that is dependent upon someone else's efforts. You may receive a large inheritance. Many have. Not because you are so smart or energetic, but because you had a father or a grandfather who was. Or in some cases, you had a father or grandfather who was never caught. <laughs> Just kidding. Mark Twain, by the way, said he spent a large sum of money to trace his family tree. And then he spent twice as much trying to keep it a secret. <laughs> One of the consequences of the new birth in Christ Jesus is that we automatically, automatically, immediately, at that moment, become heirs of all that God has in store for his children. Whatever I say to his children, I'm talking about us. Staggering fact that many of us who have been in the church all of our lives have difficulty in accepting. I never figured that out. There's a story going around that makes this point painfully clear. There's two ways of interpreting, so work on it on yourself. There was a believer who was not everything he ought to be, and he knew it. In fact, when he finally passed from this life to the next one, he was deeply concerned that St. Peter wouldn't let him through the pearly gates. But when he got to his destination, he was welcomed with open arms. Are you certain that you didn't make a mistake, he asked St. Peter? You see, there are certain parts of my life for which I'm sort of ashamed. St. Peter answered, no, we didn't make any mistake. You see, we don't keep any records. The man was greatly relieved and overjoyed. Then he saw a group of men over in the corner beating their heads against the celestial wall and clenching their fists and stomping their feet in disgust. What's the matter with them? The man asked St. Peter. Oh, St. Peter said with a smile, they thought we had kept records. <laughs> a lot of people have really trouble in believing that we do, but they don't keep records. Now, I'm not suggesting that what we do on this earth during our lifetime is unimportant. Nevertheless, at the top of our list, for which we need to be thankful this day, is that salvation is a free gift of God. It's an inheritance that we receive the moment we become children of God. We must never forget that. Father John Powell, in his book, Unconditional Love, tells about when he was serving as a chaplain in Germany. A dear little nun, 87 years old, young, was assigned to care for his room. He says that every time he left the room, even for a moment, the good sister cleaned it. She would wax the floors, polish the furniture, and so on. You know, I was in Germany for a couple of years. I never had that kind of thing. <laughs> never. I don't know why either. I mean. On one occasion, when he left the room for just a short walk, he came back to find her on her knees, putting a final sheen on the waxing job. He teased her. He said, Sister, you work too much. The dear devoted little, little sister straightened up. Rose, she's still kneeling, looked at him and said very firmly, heaven isn't cheap, you know. No, heaven isn't cheap. You see, it costs Jesus his life. Eternal life, however, is a part of our inheritance. We don't earn it. We simply receive it because of what Christ has done on the cross. Now, it troubles some of us that no records are kept in heaven because we are afraid that some of the scoundrels that we don't like anyway might accidentally get in. And they might. We forget, you see, that if heaven was based on merit, there wouldn't be a one of us get in. Think of it this way. Most of us have the privilege of being born in America. Nothing that we earned or deserve. We could just as easily have been born in a, to a starving family in some obscure part of the world. Freedom is part of our inheritance as children of this nation. I realize the parallel is not exact. Most of us were born in this country. It's not something we chose. However, we must choose to accept the inheritance that Christ gives us. That's one of the, that's the basic. That's the only requirement. We must accept it. Nevertheless, it is free. 
a gift that if you don't, you got to receive it. If you, is it, you can't give it to you, you got to receive it. Here's the second. What do you be thankful for in here? Second, the incarnation. And don't let that word scare you. Paul writes, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And a little further he writes, he, Jesus, is the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he may be preeminent. Without the incarnation, now, incarnation means simply this. God becoming flesh and re reconciling the world unto himself. God becoming flesh, incarnation. Without incarnation, there would be no inheritance. Many of you undoubtedly are familiar with the work of the California-born zoologist Diane Fossey. Remember that story? It was on, they made a movie, I think, about it. She, she worked among the gorillas in Africa. It's hard to imagine that the mighty gorilla had become an endangered species, but thanks to senseless slaughter by poachers, it's true. So Diane Fossey left her home in California to live for 18 years among the gorillas, studying them closely. Gradually, the gorillas accepted her and trusted her. From 1967 until 1985, she carried on her work. In 1985, Diane Fossey was murdered by those same people. Still trying to protect the gorillas from the home she had made her home. Now, folks, it's a long ways from California to the jungles of Africa. It's much farther, however, from the throne of God to a stable in Bethlehem and then to a cross on Calvary. Yet Christ made that journey and he made it for you and I. When Robert Louis Stevenson retired to the Samoan Islands for his health, he came to the natives of that, he became to the natives of that island a, a kind, generous friend. Stevenson was concerned that there was only a path leading from the harbor of his island over which the new friends must walk in order to bring provisions to the interior. Just a small pathway, all that walk. With his own money and personal efforts, Stevenson had a good road constructed for his people. In gratitude, the Samoans called it the road of a loving heart. I don't know about you, but I know another road of a loving heart. A young boy came to a missionary side and said, I love you, and I want you to have this. He pulled out from a straw basket the most beautiful shell the missionary had ever seen. As she admired its beauty, she recognized it was a special shell only found on the far side of the island, which was a half day's walk from the village one way. When she confronted the boy with this, he smiled and said, long walk, part of you. Crucial to everything we believe as Christians in this truth that God so loved the world that he made that long walk to come from where he was to where we are. It was impossible for us to reach out to him. He reached out to us. So there may be a difference among Christians that on a host of other things that always seem to be something we fuss about. We may be divided by some of our theology, how we baptize people, how, who we allow in the Lord's table, a lot of other things, but on one point, we all agree. God became flesh, incarnation. God became flesh and dwelt among us. That is the incarnation. That's the second thing for which every Christian can give thanks. God became one of us. Think about it. You, there, is no other, there was no other way God could have done it. It was essential that God of all creation take upon himself the flesh and life of humanity. I have a story. I, this is not perfect. It's just one that made sense to me. You know, me. It's an ant story. There was a guy who discovered an anthill in his backyard. And he come, he come fascinated by this anthill. And he wanted to try to get closer to them and, you know, study them, get, see what they were all about. So, but every time he went to the anthill, the closer he got, the more afraid they got, and they'd back in there, and they'd protect themselves and all this kind of stuff. And he, he, you know, he tried, well, you know, we'd give them some water, and he tried to do things for them, and food, and all this kind of stuff. Tried every way that he could think of to, to reach the answer. He let them know that he, he, liked, he liked to get to be know them and all. Finally, he realized there was only one way. He had to become an ant. Not perfect. 
make sense to me. God could really sometimes he had to somehow become one of us so that we understood who he was. That's what Jesus was all about. So we're thankful for our inheritance, for the incarnation that makes us that inheritance possible. And finally, we are thankful for our inclusion in the family of God. Inclusion, inclusion. God has reconciled all things into himself, St. Paul says, making peace by the blood of the cross, his son. We are included in God. Not because of anything we've done, not because we deserve it, or anything else, or no other reason, but that he loved us. He included us in this great inheritance. Final story. Jan Hi John Hyga, in his book, Lead On, tells about Dr. Claude H. Barlow, missionary to China and one of the most revered foreigners to work in that country. A strange disease for which Dr. Barlow knew no remedy was killing his people. There was no research laboratory for this disease, so Dr. Barlow conducted his own research. He studied the disease, filling a notebook with his observations. He then attained a vial of disease germs and sailed for the United States. Before he arrived, he took the germs into his own body, then went to John Hopkins University Hospital to be observed. Claude Marlow became very sick. Then he allowed his old professors at John Hopkins to use him for experimentation. Cure was eventually found which by now a healthy Claude Barlow took back to China with him. His efforts saved countless lives. When asked about the experience, Dr. Barlow replied, anyone would have done the same thing. I just happened to be in the position and had the chance to offer my body. I don't believe that. I doubt seriously that just anyone would have done that. Only a person with a very special kind of love in their heart would have made that kind of sacrifice, would have endured what he endured. It's that very special kind of love, you see, proceeding from the heart of God that holds this world together. Without that love, folks, we are orphans in a strange and hostile universe. It's our only hope. But that love does exist. It exists in this church. It really does. And it exists among people all around the world who have had an encounter with the man from Nazareth. So let's give thanks this Thursday. Let's do it for the right reasons. Let's give thanks for our inheritance as children of God, for the incarnation that makes our inheritance possible, and for our inclusion into the family of God. This is an inclusion made possible by one who took creation's longest walk from the throne of heaven to the stable of Bethlehem to a lonely cross on the hill called Calvary. Those are the things for which all of us can be thankful. At least hope we can be and will. Amen. Hymn number 260.